With a new White House only weeks away, where does that leave the state's health care program? Ways and means still uncertain. House Democrats lose a seat after the vote. House Republicans win a supermajority. And banks, overtime, and an executive exit. Arkansas Week, next. Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday. This is Arkansas Week. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Arkansas Week. It's our Thanksgiving edition, and we hope your holiday thus far has been and <laughs> into the future is a safe and happy one. We're looking toward January, but then again, isn't everyone. Michael Hiblin joins us from KUAR Public Radio in Central Arkansas. Lance Turner, reporter and editor for Arkansas Business and Hal Bass from the political science faculty at Washita Baptist University. And thanks to everybody for coming in. Hal, we're watching the Hutchinson administration about to begin its third year and its second biennium. Uh, work on budget matters, structural matters, dealing with a new and larger Republican majority in both chambers of the General Assembly. Yes, and it's raising potential for some conflict within this Republican uh, dominated administration and, 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 and government. And what's, what's going on here is that the, the immediate issue is Medicaid expansion. Um, remember that the Affordable Care Act back in 2010 provided for Medicaid expansion with substantial initial federal funding. And then the Supreme Court authorized individual states to decide whether they wanted to accept that funding or not. Arkansas, for a variety of reasons, political and economic, opted for a distinctive private option, officially entitled something like the Health Care Independence Program, and that enabled private insurers to provide this health insurance using Medicaid funds. Now, notwithstanding what's going to happen to Obamacare at the expense of the national government, Arkansas is on tap to shift from a private option model to something called Arkansas Works. And the clear thrust of this is to reduce further the um, welfare feature of the Medicare program. What's happening that's causing potential tension right Medicaid. now? Medicaid. Medicaid, yeah, the welfare program, as opposed to Medicare, which is entitlement. Medicaid is essentially a, a, a welfare program. So current policy imposed by the Arkansas legislature prohibits the Department of Human Services from trying to encourage enrollment <laughs> in this program. And legislatures are now, legislators are now indicating they're prepared to extend the same restrictions to the Arkansas Works program. And this creates a problem for, President, for a Governor Hutchinson because he and the Human Services Department want and need to promote that program in order to get the federal funds necessary to meet some very real budget challenges facing the um, administration here. We're talking about real money <laughs> here and a shortfall in the anticipated Medicaid funds coming into the state can create havoc for the governor uh, going forward. Particularly if you want to put in, you know, $50 million or so worth of tax cuts in your next budget. And that's that's something that's also causing, I think, a little bit of attention as well. There's, there, there's a lot of factors at play there. Um, you've got the governor saying, uh, without providing a lot of detail just yet, that he would like to provide about $50 million in tax cuts. Uh, you've got some legislators who would clearly want to advocate for more in terms of tax cuts, maybe up to as much as $100 million in tax cuts. Um, you've got Democrats who somehow managed to angle a majority on a key <laughs> uh, a revenue um, uh, committee at the legislature who uh, want to have something to say about tax cuts as well. So um, in addition to, to 
the the the, uh, the Arkansas Works balancing act that's been going on and been just fascinating to watch. You've got now the battle that's going to come over tax cuts, and all of these pieces have to be in the in the right place mm -hmm. for certain people to 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 meet their whatever their goals happen to be. And the governor also uh, talking about wanting to streamline uh, some government services. And on Monday during a press conference, uh, discussed a couple of items. Uh, namely, he wants to reduce the number of uh, people inspecting uh, prisons and jails around the state, uh, reduce that from 100-something uh, to 40-something, uh, also moving the uh, energy department. Uh, and this also comes as the state is uh, preparing to uh, implement the voter-approved uh, medical marijuana measure. And the governor now saying <laughs> he's looking at maybe uh, changing the voter-approved tax structure of this. Uh, said part of it is he doesn't want the state to end up having to pay in more and kind of lose money on this. So yeah, a lot of this is, uh, you know, just looking at is this actually feasible the way that that law is written right now. Uh, the Arkansas Medical Marijuana Amendment sends 50% of proceeds to vocational and technical institutions, 30% to general revenue, 10% to workforce training, 5% to the Department of Health, 4% to the Alcohol Beverage Control Division, and 1% to a new regulatory commission to be created. And the governor has already allocated, I think, $3 million in rainy day funds to kind of get this implemented. But just the talk about how the tax structure of that needs to be set up and how all of this <laughs> works together in a way that is feasible. Might take a time for some time for the smoke to clear, so to speak. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway, <laughs> this, anyway, Hal, this, 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 he's got his hands full. Now, uh, as Lance noted just a second ago, the Democrats in the House have a majority on ways in, or on revenue and tax. How tough can they hang if they tried to hang tough? I think they How can. How much leverage have they really got? Not. Much. Much. I, I don't think. Now, uh, you know, more than they would have had, mm -hmm. had they not been able to manage mm -hmm. to get control of that, 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 that key committee. But the numbers are still very much at their uh, disfavor going, going forward and getting worse, you know, as we speak. Well, given the temper of the times, too, it, would, it seems uh, quite likely, quite feasible for mm -hmm. the administration or their Republican colleagues mm -hmm. to peel off one or two mm -hmm. members on the Democratic majority there. But anyway, the, and it is a much larger GOP, by two members anyway, uh, contingent in the House, yet another Democrat just reelected announced a couple of days ago that he was flipping and joining the GOP. That gives the Republicans 75 members, three-quarter yeah. majority in the House, Mark. Yeah, that's uh, what's needed to pass uh, appropriations bills without any support from Democrats. Uh, this latest one, State Representative David Hillman of Elmira uh, made his announcement on Tuesday, said he's not really changing positions, that he's always been a conservative and uh, this won't change much in terms of how he acts, but he uh, told us in an interview that uh, it would be beneficial for the people in his district if he is part of the majority party. But this follows uh, one more that occurred shortly after Election Day. So when Republicans now, yes, a three-fourths majority, that gives them a lot more power. Yeah. On, on Election Day, the Republicans added nine seats to their legislative majority. Two since then, giving them the 75, which is certainly a, a modern high mm -hmm. for post-reconstruction high for, for Republicans. Uh, as, as Michael said, both of these switchers late suggest or come from electoral constituencies that are strongly Republican in their current partisan <clears throat> leaning. When you see partisan switching by incumbent legislatures, legislators, uh, you're seeing in the context of ongoing electoral transformations, realignments, we, we sometimes call them. The motivations can include representing constituencies, as, uh, as Michael suggested. They can also include your own electoral prospects, uh, current and future going forward. They can uh, 
reflect your realistic expectations for influencing policy outcomes. Better part of the majority than part of the minority. They can also feature your own ideological orientations. In this case, traditional conservative uh, Arkansas Democrats feel more at home with Republicans these days. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes these switchers can be indicators of coming changes. Think of, say, Strom Thurmond in South Carolina went Republican mm -hmm. back in 1964. But in these cases, it strikes me they're, they're simply responses to changes already in, in effect. They're, they're trailing as opposed to leading indicators. When you look beyond that, Hal, though, how much of this party switch, say, the gentleman from Almira, how much of the party switch is simply labeling and how much of it is really substantive or ideological? As Michael noted, uh, the, the gentleman from Alamara says, I've always been a conservative. Well, nobody ever confused the Arts House for the California Assembly. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. A couple of things. Uh, it's fair to say that for all of the apparent upheaval of Arkansas party politics, from a Democratic majority to a Republican majority. An underlying stability in terms of conservative uh, ideology and orientation remains, remains intact. I do think that a Republican majority in Arkansas is likely to behave somewhat differently from the old traditional Democratic majorities in Arkansas politics in the sense that there probably is more ideological cohesion and coherence in the Republican majority than was the case in the old style Democratic majorities mm -hmm. where you had a lot of factional divisions, a lot of regional variations across the uh, uh, Democratic caucus. I think within the Republican conference right now, there is a whole lot more unity than the Democrats ever enjoyed during their decades in power. And that, that unity, I guess, could smooth yeah. out some of these issues yeah. that Hutchinson may be yeah. having with his yeah. party, I would, I would and, it, and, and it's not a complete unity. There's always going to be right. a separation of power system, some checks and balances mm -hmm. going on here, and some resistance on the part of legislatures to executive domination and, and vice versa. But I do think there is within the current Republican majority in the state probably more ideological coherence and cohesion than Democrats were able, ever able to claim during their decades in power. Which can work either for yeah. or against the administration. Exactly. <laughs> On to something else, we uh, will dabble in national politics for just a second because we still have that parade through uh, <laughs> the, the lobby of Trump Tower. The golden carpet of yeah. politics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, of course, Senator Cotton, Attorney General, uh, Rutledge, Governor Huckabee, I've all paraded through there, but there hasn't been much on those in the last week. Yeah, we, we did see um, Leslie Rutledge, I think, our Attorney General was sort of the first high profile Arkansan to, to, to walk the, <laughs> the golden carpet, I keep calling it that, uh, through Trump Tower to have meetings, uh, and there has been word that perhaps she would be in line for, uh, for a post at, at the EPA. Uh, which would be something because she's spent a lot of her time here in Arkansas in lawsuits, fighting EPA regulations, you know, delivered via the Obama administration. Even this uh, week. Yeah. Even this week. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then also uh, Tom Cotton, who, you know, who's been, I think he's probably the most interesting of, of all of these Arkansans who've been, whose names have been kind of tossed about in terms of a possible role in the Trump administration because of, I think, first of all, how he sort of um, uh, approached Trump uh, during the run-up to the election and sort of, uh, you know, he was there, but he wasn't, and uh, he spoke at the convention, but he didn't mention Trump's name, and it was really sort of interesting how he kind of maneuvered during that entire process, and uh, so they've talked about uh, some, some, um, some military defense type positions for, for Tom Cotton. Um, who's ob obviously got a very strong history, very strong background in that area. Uh, but then there's also the question of what is Tom Cotton's political ambitions? And, uh, you know, he was in Iowa uh, several, a uh, few months ago. That ought to answer the question. I and that ought to answer the question. So, um, you know, yeah, not much news lately. Uh, Huckabee, of course, has been, has been, has had strong ties to the Trump, uh, to the Trump transition team and the Trump campaign. Actually, his daughter was, is an advisor. Uh, as well, and so there's possibilities, perhaps, that he could take on a role, uh, but we just don't know yet. There hasn't been any any movement on that front, as you said. Yeah. 
and the suggestion that Huckabee might have turned down a position because it didn't seem right and mm. he didn't want to say anything about what that was, but it does still seem Rutledge and uh, Cotton up for possible, you know, and the governor was asked about this uh, Monday and uh, said he's just kind of waiting to see what happens. Obviously, the governor would appoint <laughs> someone if uh, either of these elected officials uh, leaves to take a position with the Trump administration. The governor would appoint someone to uh, fill out the terms uh, through the end of uh, 2018. Uh, I don't think the person could then run again, uh, but it's interesting to watch that and just the, the speculation. And now as we just start getting word of who is actually being offered what, and the fact that these are people who, you know, in the past year have uh, spoken very negatively of <laughs> Trump and now, you know, saying fine things about one another, you know. Mitt well, Rock, Governor Haley's going to the UN, the apparently. Haley, so. you know, it, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it, it's been a lot of fun watching it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, an executive appointment, Hal, would seem to perhaps be a bit confining for Mr. Cotton, given what our... Yes, I'm not sure how, this goes back to what Lance was saying, I'm not sure how an executive appointment advances his own apparent electoral ambitions here. Now, public service is a calling, and when the president asks, uh, lots of people are going to be inclined to, to respond. But as best I can tell, the ask hasn't, hasn't come. And if we've learned anything in the rise of Trump, it's that there is a strong element of unpredictability here. And I'm not particularly comfortable speaking <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. on to business, and we've got quite a bit of it as we move into the uh, Christmas retail mm -hmm. season. On the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, the Dow boom yeah. Yeah. over 19. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of uh, six record closes, I believe, that the Dow has had since the presidential election, which is sort of interesting. Um, and I think there's a lot of factors at play here. I think some of them are people sort of realigning their portfolios a bit. I think the market, in some respects, really was expecting a Hillary Clinton win, and so they had made their plans accordingly, and then once that didn't happen, they had, had to readjust. And so what you see now is a lot of response by particularly industrial stocks have had a good week. Uh, companies like Caterpillar, which have a lot of uh, stake in infrastructure, and that's something that Trump has talked about. Indeed, that was among the first things he said in his election night acceptance speech, uh, was that you know we we're going to improve our roads and bridges. They're going to be the best uh, uh, that we've ever had, and um, and so companies like Caterpillar and other industrial stocks are poised to benefit from that kind of infrastructure spending should it come to pass. And in fact, even um, the American Trucking Association was eager to congratulate Trump that night as well, uh, because truckers have have a stake obviously in the infrastructure of the country, roads and bridges, etc. Um, so. Um, those stocks did well. Goldman Sachs did well, um, and so well. Banks, as a rule, have I mean, been between the Fed, mm -hmm. anticipated December, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and all this infrastructure spending. Mm -hmm. Right, banks and, have and done pretty well. Over banks the last have couple. done well, and, and banks are looking, um, you know, as well to the prospects of some deregulation happening. I mean, Dodd Frank is looking to be uh, remade, uh, if not big elements of it scrapped altogether, which which banks have been really eager. Uh, to do, particularly uh, the smaller and mid-sized banks that believe that, that those regulations have been oner particularly onerous to them. Um, so, you know, all of this is predicated on what the Trump administration has said it's going to do so far, and, and, and what truly comes to pass will, you know, that'll be, you know, we'll see what happens there. Uh, but that's some of the reason why I think markets have done well, and, and consumers, uh, you know, quite frankly, s tend to be uh, ha having a good uh, good bout of confidence. They're, they're eager to spend. Retailers are doing well. Um, and then, of course, we're going into the holiday season, so that plays a bit of a role. I think of corporate America, obviously the expectations are for lower taxes right. and less regulation, mm -hmm. which is music to, exactly. to, to the ears of, of the, uh, uh, you know, corporations and the broader financial mm -hmm. community. But I think it's also a gesture of faith in the Republican majorities in Congress to enact legislation mm -hmm. that President Trump is willing to sign here. It's not simply they're betting the farm on Trump, right. but it's also the, the confidence that what the uh, Republican House and Senate will send through the legislative uh, process is something that will, one, be signed by President Trump, 
and to be amenable to the interest of the uh, uh, corporate community. Mm -hmm. Well, segue to Arkansas banks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So we've had a continuing uh, growth on the part of Arkansas banks. A couple of key banks, Simmons First National and Pine Bluff, and then of course Home Bank Shares uh, based right here in Conway. Both of them uh, late last week uh, made uh, bank purchases out of state, continuing the streak of doing so. Uh, Simmons bought, I believe, its third bank in Tennessee. Uh, that was a that was a pretty big deal in terms of assets acquired. And then Home Bank Shares picked up yet another bank in Johnny Allison's favorite part of the world, which is Florida. Uh, and so that continues uh, growth on the part Mr. of Mr. Allison banks, being the CEO and chair of, 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 of Home Bank Shares. That's correct. So uh, those banks continue to see growth, and some of this is a response too to you know sort of the regulations that they're under. Um, you know, you cross certain asset thresholds, and more regulations come upon you. And so Johnny Allison has said that he's preferring to crawl across the 10 billion asset mark because he wants to sort of let this stuff slowly take hold rather than sort of bolting across it and doubling his size or, or whatever. So um, a lot of that's still taking place, and and uh, um, and, and Arkansas banks continue to be um, acquisitive when when uh, when the deal is right. Bank of the Ozarks among them too. Yeah. All right. Uh, on to uh, uh, overtime. Big. It's an appellate court, and there's almost certain to be further litigation. But right. this can have a big impact. Yeah. So. Businesses all over Here the country, elsewhere, I mean. right? Businesses all over the country, including in Arkansas, have been bracing for this overtime rule. And basically, this is an Obama administration uh, rule delivered through the Labor Department that uh, adds about four million workers to the pool of workers who are eligible to receive overtime, and it pretty much doubles the salary of those eligible workers. So, if you made twenty some odd thousand dollars in the past, you were eligible for overtime. Well, that, that this rule would have moved that to about double that, around $47,000. Uh, and so all manner of companies have been doing all manner of things to get ready for these regulations. Some of them have been raising worker pay uh, to, you know, if you're on the cusp of that threshold, they're going to go ahead and raise your pay because they figure it's, 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 a, it's a better deal for them to do that than to pay overtime, et cetera, et cetera. Some have been cutting hours, some have been reconfiguring their workforces to kind of get around this. Well, a uh, federal court on Tuesday blocked the Im implementation of that rule. This rule, I think, is one of those things that under the Trump administration, people were thinking probably would not survive very long anyway. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, kind of a, a sigh of relief, I think, on the one hand, for a lot of businesses who were not looking forward to implementing this, this new way of life. Um, and of course it will be, you know, this is just an injunction. So this gives the courts time to work through the legalities of that rule. Arkansas among the 21 states that challenge this rule. Um, but it'll give them time to sort of figure out whether this rule is, is, uh, is, is legal. Um, so there could be more to come, but I think, you know, the, the prospects of this rule surviving anyway into the next year were, were kind of dim anyway. And one other that we need to get in, a change, well, yeah, a change at the top, or yes. near the top anyway, in Northwest Arkansas. Yeah, Tyson Foods, uh, a new CEO this week. Donnie Smith had been the, the CEO since 2009, and he announced uh, sort of suddenly a surprise this week that he would be stepping down at the end of the year, and a man named Tom Hayes, who has been president of the company, uh, will become CEO. Uh, Tom Hayes is interesting because he came up through the Hillshire brands purchased uh, of, a few, of a couple of years ago. Um, and it sort of signals a couple of things. I think at least one of the key items is that Tyson is really um, going all in even more on the prepared food sides of business. So, you know, they've been a commodity business, meat processing, chicken, beef, uh, pork. Uh, prepared foods, however, where they've really been spending more of their time and investment uh, as a higher margin business and one that they really want to get more into. And this is an element of, of this change, I think, is signaling that they are very committed to that part of the business. Animal protein is still Tyson. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But, uh, you know, the prepared stuff, the stuff in your freezer section, the stuff, you know, the, um, I don't really quite know how to describe it. The breakfast foods, the prepared stuff you throw in yeah. the oven really quickly, uh, that's becoming more and more lucrative for them and where, they, where they're going to spend a lot more time. Well, the consumers are willing to pay for convenience. That's right. Pop Absolutely. it in there and nuke it. Absolutely. All yeah. Right. Can you give us your, what are the indicators, Lance? Christmas retail is very important mm -hmm. to DF&A and as well as to retailers mm -hmm. themselves. What's the outlook? Has it shifted any? I think it's looking pretty good. And, uh, you know, the Cyber Monday numbers I looked at the other day uh, talked about uh, an increase from last year. Of course, Cyber Monday is, is the Monday after Thanksgiving. It's, it's one of the little signposts of the holiday season. You've got your Black Friday spending. You've got your Cyber Monday spending. Um, um, 
all indications are that spending will be healthy to up this year. So that should make uh, a lot of retailers happy. And then, of course, for your, uh, for your state and local governments, that should be pretty good as well. Well, convenience, too, not only in fast food, but in Christmas buying. Click, click, click. Definitely. Right. Yeah. Online And online is, is sort of roiling retail anyway. It's roiling every <laughs> conceivable business, uh, but retail particularly. And so retailers are responding. And that's why you see Walmart talking about Cyber Monday deals that they're going to put online mm -hmm. Friday or pr practically Thanksgiving anyway, uh, because people would rather go online. It's harder to get people into the stores when you can sit there in your pajamas uh, and go to Amazon <laughs> and order everything that you need and not have to worry about crowds and lines and, and whether a particular item will be there or not. Um, so that's what the brick and mortar retailers are battling. That's what Walmart in particular is battling. Uh, and that fight is even more pronounced during the holiday season. Got to end it there because we're out of time. Guys, thanks to you for coming in. As always, thanks to you for joining us. Have a good, safe holiday, and we'll see you next week. Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday.